Chapter Five of the Spoils of Poynton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spoils of Poynton by Henry James. Chapter Five. I'll give up the house if they'll let me take what I require. That, on the morrow, was what Mrs. Garrett's stifled night had qualified her to say with a tragic face at breakfast. Fleda reflected that what she required was simply every object that surrounded them. The poor woman would have admitted this truth and accepted the conclusion to be drawn from it. The reduction to the absurd of her attitude, the exaltation of her revolt, the girl's dread of a scandal, of spectators and critics, diminished the more she saw how little vulgar avidity had to do with this rigour. It was not the crude love of possession. It was the need to be faithful to a trust and loyal to an idea. The idea was surely noble. It was that of the beauty Mrs. Gareth had so patiently and consummately wrought. Pale but radiant, her back to the wall, she rose there like a heroine guarding a treasure. To give up the ship was to flinch from her duty. There was something in her eyes that declared she would die at her post. If their difference should become public, the shame would be all for the others. If Waterbath thought it could afford to expose itself, then Waterbath was welcome to the folly. Her fanaticism gave her a new distinction, and Fleda perceived almost with awe that she had never carried herself so well. She trod the place like a reigning queen or a proud usurper. Full as it was of splendid pieces, it could show in those days no ornament so effective as its menaced mistress. Our young lady's spirit was strangely divided. She had a tenderness for Owen which she deeply concealed, yet it left her occasion to marvel at the way a man was made, who could care in any relation for a creature like Mona Brigstock, when he had known in any relation a creature like Adela Gareth. With such a mother to give him the pitch, how could he take it so low? She wondered that she didn't despise him for this, but there was something that kept her from it. If there had been nothing else, it would have sufficed that she really found herself from this moment the medium of communication with him. "'He'll come back to assert himself,' Mrs. Gareth had said, and the following week Owen, in fact, reappeared. He might merely have written, Fleda could see, but he had come in person because it was at once nicer for his mother and stronger for his cause. He didn't like the row, though Mona probably did. If he hadn't a sense of beauty, he had, after all, a sense of justice. But it was inevitable he should clearly announce at Poynton the date at which he must look to find the house vacant. "'You don't think I'm rough or hard, do you?' he asked of Fleda, his impatience shining in his idle eyes as the dining hour shines in club windows. "'The place at Rick stands there with open arms, and then I give her lots of time. Tell her she can remove everything that belongs to her.' Fleda recognized the elements of what the newspapers call a deadlock, in the circumstance that nothing at Poynton belonged to Mrs. Gareth, either more or less than anything else. She must either take everything or nothing, and the girl's suggestion was that it might perhaps be an inspiration to do the latter and begin again with a clean page. What, however, was the poor woman in that case to begin with? What was she to do at all on her meagre income but make the best of the objet d'art of Rick's, the treasures collected by Mr. Gareth's maiden aunt? She had never been near the place. For long years it had been let to strangers, and after that the foreboding that it would be her doom had kept her from the abasement of it. She had felt that she should see it soon enough. But Fleda, who was careful not to betray to her that Mona had seen it and had been gratified, knew her reasons for believing that the maiden's aunt's principles had had much in common with the principles of Waterbath. The only thing, in short, that she would ever have to do with the objet d'art of Rick's would be to turn them out into the road. What belonged to her at Poynton, as Owen said, would conveniently mitigate the void resulting from that demonstration. The exchange of observations between the friends had grown very direct by the time Fleda asked Mrs. Gareth whether she literally meant to shut herself up and stand a siege, or whether it was her idea to expose herself 
more informally to be dragged out of the house by constables. Oh, I prefer the constables and the dragging, the heroine of Poynton had answered. I want to make Owen and Mona do everything that will be most publicly odious. She gave it out that it was her one thought now to force them to a line that would dishonour them and dishonour the tradition they embodied, though Fleda was privately sure that she had visions of an alternative policy. The strange thing was that, proud and fastidious all her life, she now showed so little distaste for the world's hearing of the squabble. What had taken place in her, above all, was that a long resentment had ripened. She hated the effacement to which English usage reduced the widowed mother. She had discoursed of it passionately to Fleda, contrasted it with the beautiful homage paid in other countries to women in that position, women no better than herself, whom she had seen acclaimed and enthroned, whom she had known and envied, made in short as little as possible a secret of the injury, the bitterness she found in it. The great wrong Owen had done her was not his taking up with Mona. That was disgusting, but it was a detail, an accidental form. It was his failure from the first to understand what it was to have a mother at all, to appreciate the beauty and sanctity of the character. She was just his mother, as his nose was just his nose, and he had never had the least imagination or tenderness or gallantry about her. One's mother, gracious heaven, if one were the kind of fine young man one ought to be, the only kind Mrs. Gareth cared for, was a subject for poetry, for idolatry. Hadn't she often told Fleda of her friend Madame de Jaume, the wittiest of women, but a small, black, crooked person, each of whose three boys, when absent, wrote to her every day of their lives? She had the house in Paris, she had the house in Poitou, she had more than in the lifetime of her husband, to whom, in spite of her appearance, she had afforded repeated cause for jealousy, because she had to the end of her days the supreme word about everything. It was easy to see that Mrs. Gareth would have given again and again her complexion, her figure, and even perhaps the spotless virtue she had still more successfully retained, to have been the consecrated Madame de Jaume. She wasn't, alas! and this was what she had at present a magnificent occasion to protest against. She was, of course, fully aware of Owen's concession, his willingness to let her take away with her the few things she liked best, but as yet she only declared that to meet him on this ground would be to give him a triumph, to put him impossibly in the right. Liked best? There wasn't a thing in the house she didn't like best, and what she liked better still was to be left where she was. How could Owen use such an expression without being conscious of his hypocrisy? Mrs. Gareth, whose criticism was often gay, dilated with sardonic humour on the happy look a dozen objects from Poynton would wear, and the charming effect they were conduced to when interspersed with the peculiar features of Rick's. What had her whole life been but an effort toward completeness and perfection? Better water-bath at once in its cynical unity than the ignominy of such a mixture. All this was no great help to Fleda, in so far as Fleda tried to rise to her mission of finding a way out. When, at the end of a fortnight, Owen came down once more, it was ostensibly to tackle a farmer whose proceedings had been irregular. The girl was sure, however, that he had really come, on the instance of Mona, to see what his mother was doing. He wished to satisfy himself that she was preparing her departure, and he desired to perform a duty, distinct but not less imperative, in regard to the question of the perquisites with which she would retreat. The tension between them was now such that he had to perpetuate these offences without meeting his adversary. Mrs. Gareth was as willing as himself that he should address to Fleda Vetch whatever cruel remarks he might have to make. She only pitied her poor young friend for repeated encounters with a person as to whom she perfectly understood the girl's repulsion. Fleda thought it nice of Owen not to have expected her to write to him. He wouldn't have wished any more than herself that she should have the air of spying on his mother in his interest. What made it comfortable to deal with him in this more familiar way was the sense that she understood so perfectly how poor Mrs. Gareth suffered. 
and that she measured so adequately the sacrifice the other side did take rather monstrously for granted. She understood equally how Owen himself suffered, now that Mona had already begun to make him do things he didn't like. Vividly Fleda apprehended how she would have first made him like anything she would have made him do, anything even as disagreeable as this appearing there to state, virtually on Mona's behalf, that of course there must be a definite limit to the number of articles appropriated. She took a longish stroll with him in order to talk the matter over, to say if she didn't think a dozen pieces chosen absolutely at will would be a handsome allowance and above all to consider the very delicate question of whether the advantage enjoyed by Mrs. Gareth mightn't be left to her honour. To leave it so was what Owen wished, but there was plainly a young lady at Waterbath to whom, on his side, he already had to render an account. He was as touching in his off-hand annoyance as his mother was tragic in her intensity, for if he couldn't help having a sense of propriety about the whole matter, so he could as little help hating it. It was for his hating it, Fleda reasoned, that she liked him so, and her insistence to his mother on the hatred perilously resembled, on one or two occasions, a revelation of the liking. There were moments when, in conscience, that revelation pressed her, inasmuch as it was just on the ground of her not liking him that Mrs. Gareth trusted her so much. Mrs. Gareth herself didn't in these days like him at all, and she was, of course, always on Mrs. Gareth's side. He ended, really, while the preparations for his marriage went on, by quite a little custom of coming and going, but at no one of these junctures would his mother receive him. He talked only with Fleda, and strolled with Fleda, and when he asked her, in regard to the great matter, if Mrs. Gareth were really doing nothing, the girl usually replied, she pretends not to be, if I may say so, but I think she's really thinking over what she'll take. When her friend asked her what Owen was doing, she could have but one answer. He's waiting, dear lady, to see what you do. Mrs. Gareth, a month after she had received her great shock, did something abrupt and extraordinary. She caught up her companion and went to have a look at Rick's. They had come to London first and taken a train from Liverpool Street and the least of the sufferings they were armed against was that of passing the night. Fleda's admirable dressing-bag had been given her by her friend. "'Why, it's charming!' she exclaimed a few hours later, turning back again into the small, prim parlour from a friendly advance to the single plate of the window. Mrs. Gareth hated such windows, the one flat glass sliding up and down, especially when they enjoyed a view of four iron pots on pedestals, painted white and containing ugly geraniums, ranged on the edge of a gravel path, and doing their best to give it the air of a terrace. Fleda had instantly averted her eyes from these ornaments, but Mrs. Gareth grimly gazed, wondering, of course, how a place in the deepest depths of Essex, and three miles from a small station, could contrive to look so suburban. The room was practically a shallow box, with the junction of the walls and ceiling guiltless of curve or cornice, and marked merely by the little band of crimson paper glued round the top of the other paper, a turbid grey sprigged with silver flowers. This decoration was rather new and quite fresh, and there was in the centre of the ceiling a big square beam papered over in white, as to which Fleda hesitated about venturing to remark that it was rather picturesque. She recognised in time that this venture would be weak, and that throughout she should be able to say nothing either for the mantelpieces or for the doors of which she saw her companion become sensible with a soundless moan. On the subject of doors especially, Mrs. Gareth had the finest views. The thing in the world she most despised was the meanness of the single flap. From end to end at Poynton there were high double leaves, at Rick's the entrances to the rooms were like the holes of rabbit hutches. It was all, none the less, not so bad as Fleda had feared. It was faded and melancholy, whereas there had been a danger that it would be contradictious and positive, cheerful and loud. The house was crowded with objects of which the aggregation somehow made a thinness and the futility a grace, 
things that told her they had been gathered as slowly and as lovingly as the golden flowers of Poynton. She, too, for a home, could have lived with them. They made her fond of the old maiden aunt. They made her even wonder if it didn't work more for happiness not to have tasted, as she herself had done, of knowledge. Without resources, without a stick, as she said, of her own, Fleda was moved, after all, to some secret surprise at the pretensions of a shipwrecked woman who could hold such an asylum cheap. The more she looked about, the surer she felt of the character of the maiden aunt, the sense of whose dim presence urged her to pacification. The maiden aunt had been a dear. She would have adored the maiden aunt. The poor lady had had some tender little story. She had been sensitive and ignorant and exquisite. That, too, was a sort of origin, a sort of atmosphere for relics and rarities, though different from the sorts most prized at Poynton. Mrs. Gareth had, of course, more than once said that one of the deepest mysteries of life was the way that, by certain natures, hideous objects could be loved. But it wasn't a question of love now for these. It was only a question of a certain practical patience. Perhaps some thought of that kind had stolen over Mrs. Gareth, when at the end of a brooding hour she exclaimed, taking in the house with a strenuous sigh, Well, something can be done with it. Fleda had repeated to her more than once the indulgent fancy about the maiden aunt. She was so sure she had deeply suffered. I'm sure I hope she did, was, however, all that Mrs. Gareth had replied. End of chapter 5